influential person, the most significant and the most truthful person ever lived in the history of the world. Just look at his humble birth, his immaculate conception, his excruciating death, his victorious and triumphant resurrection, his glorious ascension, and then his amazing and breathtaking return as it will be. Just look at his claims. He said, I'm the life and the resurrection. He says, I'm the true wine. I am the living water. I am the light of the world. I am. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the true vine and so forth. These are some outrageous claims and absolutely remarkable. But if they are untrue, they are the most ridiculous, ludicrous, and laughable claims. But we know from the history and the biblical narratives and from the church history and from the testimonies of people that they are true and he is what he claims to be. There were many people who lived and they wanted to be God. They claimed to be God. But Jesus, the God himself, the one true God, he became a man. Man claimed to be God, but a God became a man so that we could be reconciled back to Father. Let me direct your attention to the Lord's table for a moment. Paul writes in Romans 3 and 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Some of you may not have an idea what really that means. It doesn't mean the problem is that we have sinned. The problem is we have done nothing but sin. We are born in sin. We are conceived in sin. We have known nothing but sin. We are trained, we are brought up, we are raised in sin. As the Bible tells, our society drinks down iniquity like it was water. We hated God, rebelled against God, we despised his laws. And we reject the remedy of his salvation. We think too much of ourselves and think too little of God if we do it at all. What we need to understand is that men are evil and they are wretched. But if you stand up and say, I do not agree with you, as somebody did the other day, and I told them, it's because you don't believe the Bible. Because the Bible says in Genesis 8 that inclination of a human heart has been perpetually evil from the childhood. You need to understand that gospel is an offensive message because it's intolerant to sin. And we have lived far too long in offense to God and about time that we will be offended when we are confronted with our sin. We don't want to call sin, sin because it offends men. Oh, so be it. Jesus always offended people. Look at the apostles. Look at all the prophets. They were all in, they were in the business of offending people. Why? Because they loved people. Because they were living in offense to God. That's why Paul says it's a foolishness to those who are perishing. It's a folly for people who are dying. But for us who are saved, it is the marvelous power of God. Genesis, again, as I quoted, Paul Washer once said, this, why is sin so terrible? Why is there a preacher always banging and always shouting about sin? Why is sin so terrible? Because it is committed against a holy God. And why don't we tremble? Because we don't understand what it means. And why don't we understand what it means? Because we don't know who we are and who God truly is. And because we don't know the scripture, the Bible tells us that God is a holy being. But bless God, he did not leave us in our lostness, in our deadness and despair. He sent his only begotten, precious, sinless, spotless son to die in my place. If only we will understand what it means to be forgiven. We will just fall out of our places and we'll just cry out what it means to be forgiven. We don't understand what it is, means to be forgiven. The psalmist says, blessed are those whose sins are forgiven. Do we understand the magnitude of this reality that I am forgiven and I stand justified before a justifier God, that he looks at me and he declares me righteous, the most heinous, wicked, liar, wretched, sinful, hateful person stand righteous in front of God just for one reason. That's what this, tab this table figuratively reminds us that Christ took my sins upon himself. Guys, what you need to folks needs to remember, we are not saved because Romans whipped Jesus. We are not saved because, because uh, uh, Pilate performed all these, carry out these nasty atrocities upon Jesus. We are saved because when Jesus hung on that cross, he bore my sins upon himself. He drank the wrath of God, the fierce fury that should be poured out on me and on you. We should have been in that place. But Jesus said, I'll drink that cup. 
and he drank it to the last drop and he returned it to father and he said father it is finished and as their father said it is finished indeed son that is the only hope that human being would ever have that 2000 years ago a god man a man called jesus christ died on the cross the only begotten precious son of god he took my place and he died for my sake and he accomplished and this table is the very reminder of that very thing that our very savior did about 2000 years ago do you understand that he died for you do you realize what it means that he really did it's not a, it's not a philosophy it's not a fantasy it's not a hallucination it's not it's not something that has been passed down to us he really did he, it was real blood. It was really his blood that trickled down on that tree. It was, it was for us. It was for me. And it was for your sake. Do you understand what Christ has done? Nobody will ever be saved without Jesus Christ. People in the Old Testament looked forward and were saved through Jesus. People in the New Testament looked back and were saved through Jesus Christ. People now look back in the history and saved through Jesus Christ. There is no salvation other than Jesus Christ. Acts 4 tells salvation is found in no one but in Christ alone. Now let me just conclude that. Are you saved? We've heard that loads of times, numerous times. Have you repented of your sins? Are you continuously repenting of your sin? Do you believe in Jesus? Are you growing in your believing in Jesus? If you don't understand a word I have said so far, you need to be afraid. You need to be very afraid because your eternality, your life depends upon it. You will stand before him one day. People turn around and say, university, when I talk to peers, and they would say, well, we don't care, and I'm not bothered. And I tell them, you will care, and you will be bothered. It's just a matter of time. Are you really a Christian? What do you want me to do? I turn up every Sunday. I even did the evangelism yesterday. I sing the loudest in the choir. I give offerings. I help poor and sick. Watch this. I even preach. Jesus has a news for us. Matthew 7, 41. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of Father, of my Father who is in heaven. You need to understand that when we need to emphasize something, we either raise our voice or use adjectives, but in Hebrew, when they need to make a point, they repeat it. It's called parallelism. They repeat it. Jesus said, truly, truly, I tell you. Verily, verily. Now he says, Lord, Lord. It means they are not Christian who suddenly turn up Sunday so church. These are serious Christian. Looks like apparently serious Christian. They might be the leadership. They might be the choir. They might even be the preacher. But Jesus says, I didn't even know you. Away from me. Depart from me, you evil doers. What is he saying here? What is he actually saying is, is very clear. Well, you could say, I don't look much different than the rest of my church members. Well, if you have to dismiss this church service right now, and I guarantee you, you knock at every people's door around just in the neighborhood, majority, vast majority of people would say we are Christian. We run a nursing agency as a family. I go to people's houses on a regular basis, all through the West Midlands, about 10, 15 houses in two couple of days time. I meet numerous people. And there is a question in our assessment that I have to do as a nursing assessor. We ask them about their faith group. Believe you me, 95% people will say Christian. And you know and as do I do that not all of them will say that they are Christian. Then the question is who truly is Christian? Because if I ask you are you a Christian, you will say yes I am. But so do they. Then I will ask you why, how do you know that you are a Christian? You will say because we believe in Jesus. Well so do they. Well you will say I know Jesus. Well so majority of them do. So what is the difference? Who truly is Christian the question is not that you know Jesus the question is does Jesus know you I could shout all my life and say I need to go to the kingdom palace I know the queen the Queen's God are out there I would say I know the queen they will let me in because everyone knows the queen but if the queen steps up and he said hey I know Rakim let him in trust me I will be let in it's not that if you know Jesus does Jesus know you let me help you the mark distinction just carefully listen to this one and I'll end up with that. The marked distinction of a true Christian is the one who does the will of Father and it is his lifestyle that shows that he truly is Christian. Jesus said you will know them by their fruit. You cannot say 
I'm Christian and live like the word. You can't act like the word. You can't smell like the word, dress like the word, talk like the word, walk like the word. You cannot do that. And even if you want to do that, you will not be able to do that because God will not let you do that. Why? Because you belong to him. You're a new creature. You're a new creation. You're a changed person, a transformed person. You have new desires, new things. You hate the things God hates. You love the things God loves. You don't do what displeases God. Your heart is set on different things. You don't watch things that God hates. You don't dress sensually the word, the way the world is. You're a transformed person. You are growing in your hatred towards sin. You desire to be holy. You're eager to know God. That's where we turn up every Sunday here to listen to me or anybody else you're here to see one thing to behold the glory of Jesus Christ the spirit bears our witness is this a reality in our life do we yearn for holiness are we different than other people do we dress the same way talk the same way act the same way think the same way that there are many good chances that you're not even really Christian because Jesus said you would know them by their fruit, because everyone claims to be Christian. Now, how are we going to make a distinction? It's the lifestyle, the fruit, what you really carry on, that what really shows that you belong to Jesus. Because even if you would want to get your life marred, you will not be able to, because God's reputation is on the line. Because if he is able enough to save you from hell, he is able enough to keep you holy in this world. We can't act like the world. We can't talk like, walk like, talk like, smell like the world. Christian people ought to be different. What I'm saying is you might still fall away, but Father will come for you. Trust me, he will come for you. You fall away. You may sin. You may slide into sin. You don't become sinless. You're still tempted, but God will come for you. Why? Because you belong to him. Is this a reality in your life? When you sin, does it feel like a knife trusted in your side? Or do you carry on happily and you're not even bothered? Because if that's what describes you, trust me, you're not even Christian. Because you will not be able to live happily and successfully, not a prosperity gospel, but you will not be successfully able to sin. Because God will come for you and he will drag you back. Why? Because you belong to him. Do you belong to Christ? You will be markedly, conspicuously, visibly, and noticeably different. You don't become sinless, but you become sensitive to sin. And Christ will come for you. You will, he will not let you let your life marred and destroyed like anybody else. If we truly belong to Christ, we will be known by our food. Lastly, what does our profession of faith count? What do you think? What does profession of our faith really count? Absolutely nothing. The devil professes that. The Bible says he even trembles. He knows he is the Lord. So where is the difference? The difference is our life. Are we living in holiness, in righteousness, desiring for God, loving him, want to know him, growing in righteousness, and just be absolutely maddened by the reality that there is a God up there who loves me and I want to serve him. May this table this morning help us think and reflect what this almighty, powerful, holy God has accomplished through his son, Jesus Christ, by dying for us in our place. And we may find that reconciliation and that soothing and that comfort in Christ that him can only give us. May God bless you this morning.